Well, welcome to our afternoon session, our first afternoon session. The speaker in this session is Professor John Hare of Yale Divinity School, uh, who will be speaking to us about animal sacrifices, and the comments will be offered by James Crenshaw of Duke Divinity School, and now retired. So, Professor Hare. Uh, in this paper, I'm going to reflect as a moral philosopher on the topic of animal sacrifices in the Hebrew scriptures. Because the central ethical criticism of animal sacrifices is that they are violence against animals, I, in the main um, copy of the paper that I'm um, abbreviating, I give some references. I want to start with a section on the more general treatment of non-human animals that we find in the Hebrew scriptures, and I will then spend most of my time on the sacrificial system. I should say immediately that I am neither a Bible scholar nor an anthropologist. I'm not going to try to talk about the order of composition of the relevant texts or about the cross-cultural similarities and dissimilarities that lie behind various theories about the origin of sacrifice in human culture. In my own work, I've written about the notion of what I call a moral gap between us and God, and the notion of what I call evaluative transfer. I want to expand on these ideas, talking about a holiness gap rather than a moral gap. But I want to begin by acknowledging that philosophers sometimes have a tin ear for nuances and ambiguities in biblical texts, and that we often do not know the relevant social scientific literature. This kind of thing is almost inevitable in cross-disciplinary work. I have observed that biblical scholars and social scientists sometimes make use of philosophical ideas without knowing the contemporary discussions of them within the discipline of philosophy. I think we have to try to be patient with each other about this and learn what we can. First, then, some general points about how non-human animals are viewed, especially in Genesis and in the prophets. Those who have grown up in a carnivorous culture, like our own, who assume that their diet is perfectly consistent with God's will for their lives, are sometimes surprised to discover that Genesis describes the original state in which we were created in terms of unrestricted vegetarianism. And the prophets pick this up in their description of the eventual state towards which we are headed. I'm not here trying to talk about the historical or scientific accuracy of these pictures, but about the stories on their own terms, in as far as we can discern this. On the third day, God created the plants and trees, and then on the sixth day, God created both land animals and humans and gave to both the animals and the humans every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it to be theirs for food. God also gave dominion to humans over the fish and birds and land animals, and it is a matter of controversy just what the Hebrew translated dominion means. But it certainly does not mean that humans are to eat the other animals. Perhaps it means that humans have stewardship over the other animals. In the account in Genesis 2, what Adam actually does with the birds and animals is to name them. The best known description of our vegetarian destination is Isaiah 11, where the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. This description of a peaceable kingdom is foreshadowed symbolically in a number of places, of which I will mention two. The first is the ark, into which the animals go in seven or seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, 
and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Note that all carnivorous animals are unclean. The fact that they eat the forbidden blood of other animals may not be the reason why God forbids us to eat them, but the prohibitions to them and to us are consistent. This picture of the ark and the human responsibility for it has proved fruitful for the ecology movement as a picture of our present condition. Planet Earth can be seen as an ark. When the flood is over, God makes a covenant with every living creature, symbolized by the rainbow. And this universal scope of the covenant is repeated three times in Genesis 9. The second foreshadowing is the picture of the promised land given to the people of Israel wandering in the desert, as described in Deuteronomy. It will be a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and they will lack nothing, but not a land with abundant game. I anticipate that you will object that God does give permission to eat meat after the flood. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But this permission comes in the context of a prescription of capital punishment for humans who shed blood, for which God will require an accounting. And God also requires an accounting from every animal of the eating of meat with its lifeblood still in it. My suggestion then is that both provisions, both meat eating and capital punishment, are God's, so to speak, second best, a divine concession. The best situation, the one at our origin and the one at our destination, is one where we do not kill each other, animals do not kill each other, and we do not kill animals for meat. I do not know that this is a correct account of the permission to Noah, but it seems plausible. Note that even though permission is given to eat flesh, it is not given to eat blood, which is the life of it. That is to say, there is a distinction between the flesh of the animal and its life, to which humans still have obligation. We do not have to identify life with blood to make this distinction. Animals are not merely to be consumed, even if we are conceded permission to eat the meat. It would be possible to be dualist about the subject of this obligation and to talk about animal soul in a dualist manner, separate from animal body. But this text suggests a non-dualist thought, that the life of the animal is tied up intimately with its materiality, but it is not identical with the body that we eat. In any case, whether materialist or not, the point is that the animal is seen here as a subject, a being with whom a covenant could be had and to whom one could have obligations. Those of us who no longer live in agrarian or pastoralist societies will find it harder to see animals as subjects just because we no longer live with animals on a regular basis. The sacrificial system, as described in Leviticus, should be understood against the background of a society in many ways unlike the urban society of the New Testament. The people of Israel kept animals whom they considered part of their households. I will give two examples of this. It's not a controversial point, I think, but it is helpful in distinguishing the treatment of non-human animals in the Hebrew scriptures from the treatment in, for example, the letters of Paul. The first example is the story that Nathan told to David about the poor man's lamb. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. The lamb which was stolen and slaughtered by a rich man 
prompting David to reply, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore, which means to pay for, the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Second is the example in Jonah, who reluctantly preached to the Ninevites. And the king proclaimed a fast, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And the book ends with God's rebuke to Jonah, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and also much cattle. <laughs>